Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, y'all love the Lord down here? Y'all love the Bible here, right? I know for a fact you love the Bible. Let's open our scriptures to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12 in the NIV version. And I'm going to look at verses 1 through 12. When you got it, somebody say, I got it. My God, that's four people. <laughs> when you find it, somebody say, I got it. All right, you got it for real? Stand on your feet then. Let's read it together. You got it. Now, if your feet are old and you got bunions on them, I understand. All right. But come on, let's stand and read this word. Can we do it together? Yeah. Ready? Read. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. Come on. Put to death with the sword. All right, let's pause right there. Okay. So let's start over with the wind. All right. And then the, pause, the, the, the commas, we'll pause. And let's read it strong. Ready? Read. When he saw that this met with the approval among the Jews, pause. He proceeded to seize Peter also. We'll wait to the next scripture. Read. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. And after arresting Peter, they brought him before the kept in prison but the church was earnestly praying to God for him the night before Herod was to bring him to trial bound with two chains your cloak around you. What's really happening? He thought he was seeing a vision. Came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. Did y'all see that last thing? The Jewish people were hoping would happen. Come on, read verse 12. Well, Father, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes on a simple topic that I really want to teach if you will let me do it. It's called interrupting bad intentions. Somebody shout that out loud. Interrupting bad intentions. An interruption is an act of hindering. It's an act of breaking an activity or breaking time. It's the breaking of continuity or uniformity. And it breaks what is, and it breaks what is to come. It slices through the flow of someone else's intentions. It is a symptom of impulsivity. Have you ever been around an impulsive person before? They talk on a whim. And they don't concern themselves with much forethought considering the topical discussion nor respecting the moment or the person who is actually talking. 
They believe that their contribution is more powerful or more significant than what someone else is already contributing to that particular session. But the thing about interruptions are that they're very tricky. What makes them tricky? Because while in one regard, uh, you kind of got to be rude to interrupt a person. But when it comes to standing up for somebody that you love, it causes someone to be bold to actually stand up and interrupt someone who's using all manner of evil to talk about somebody that you love. What I don't understand is, is how the same person can use the power to be rude, but won't use the power to be bold to actually stand up and tell somebody, shut your mouth. Because the person that you're talking about is somebody that I actually love. I don't understand how is it that your love doesn't have a boldness to stand up and tell somebody that you don't even know that is discussing something about somebody that you actually love or care about. I question, do they love you? Because if they do love you, then the boldness would rise in the middle of the conversation. I want to know who's, who, who's bold in this church tonight. Not, not, very, not very many people are bold in here tonight. Do we got at least half the room that's bold in here tonight? That if somebody was talking about your child or talking about your loved one, would you stand up for the person? Or would you be quiet? One of the things that's killing the body of Christ and killing families is that we will not speak up. We will stay silent while people we love are being crushed and being killed. We would rather hush and not contribute to the conversation. That, I believe, is one of the worst, worst representations of somebody that says they love you. While we're looking at this word interruption, then we got to look at the word intentions. It is the idea that you plan or intend to carry out. It is something that uh, if a person says that they have intentions, then they've worked it out in their mind. They've planned it out on paper. They've had meetings about it. They've concretized the thought. And they're intentionally going after whatever it is, the dream, uh, the future plans, the marriage, uh, dating, uh, trying to acquire property, whatever it is. They got in to get after it. I think that is interesting to me when we look at it because both of them are cognitive issues. T intentions and interruptions. Intentions and interruptions. So I kind of understand when it says so a man think it in his heart. So a man think it so is he. Intentionally I am what I think. Intentionally I will become what I think. What I think. Do you have the intentions to become greater? Or do you just have an idea that you can be great? Do you have the intentions to conquer what's in front of you? Or do you just have this idea that you would do it? Do you actually have the grit, the mindset to stand in front of Satan's people who are trying to destroy you and stand there and intend to be successful? Those are the people that I want to talk to tonight. Those of you that says, I intend on being great. I intend on making it. Whatever making it is, look at me. That's what it is. I wish I had a witness in here right now. I want you to look at somebody and tell them, I intend to make it. I intend to make it. Oh my God. Come on somebody, shout it like you believe. I intend to make it. You've got to be intentional. But what's interesting to me is that the Bible is full of intentions and interruptions. God interrupted Abraham's life. And Abraham intentionally left. He went where God told him to go, not knowing where God told him to go. Interruptions and intentions. Jarius interrupted Jesus. And Jesus intentionally healed his daughter. He intentionally did it. When you look at Pharaoh, he intentionally oppressed Israel. And God interrupted Pharaoh's intentions. Balaam was headed to curse the children of Israel, but God interrupted him. And he said, you cannot curse. But God 
has already blessed. Saul was on his way to intentionally incarcerate and to kill the followers of the way. But the angel of the Lord interrupted his plans, stopped him, and blinded him. Interruptions and intentions are all through the scripture. And tonight, somebody shout tonight. Herod Agrippa has bad intentions against the believers and against some of its leaders. So when you look at Herod and you trace him down, his history is interesting because of the Jews and the early Christian churches, the Jewish culture or the Jewish religious system and Hellenism kind of flowed together. Hellenism is Greek culture of the Greek. So the Romans were in charge of Jew of the Jews because Palestine uh, was under their rule. And so when you had uh, the former emperor who had been crushed and when he had been crushed and, and killed, then Herod the Great became uh, the king. Once Herod the Great became the king, Rome was in charge of them. Now, uh, this particular group called the Herods, they had a Herodian dynasty. Somebody shout Herodian dynasty. This simply means that they had a lineage of Herods. Every time you see in scripture, it's not just one Herod, but there are several Herods. Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, Herod uh, Philip, Herod Archelaus, Herod Agrippa, one and two, and then you had Herod Philip as well. Each one of these Herods was assigned in an era to take out the believers. So if you remember Herod the Great, Herod the Great was around when Jesus was born. And when Jesus was born, Herod the Great was trying to make sure that no Nobody was going to take his throne because he was part Jew. He was part Jew, and since he was part Jew, the Jews didn't like him. But he was under Roman rule, but he rolled with the Romans. So he was too Roman to be Roman. He was too Jewish to be Jew, and he was too Roman to be, you see what I'm saying? So he had a counterbalance, and nobody liked him. So this particular man said, here's the deal. I'm going to kill every kid under the age of two looking for Jesus. But what I think is interesting about God, he interrupted that. He's an amazing God that has a way of interrupting the plans of the enemy. Herod tried to snuff Jesus out, but Jesus made sure that he, God made sure that Jesus was tucked away so the enemy wouldn't get to him. When you look at Herod Antipas, Herod Antipas was around when John the Baptist was around and John the Baptist was preaching, preaching about the kingdom of God. He made sure that John's head was chopped off. There's always an enemy that's trying to destroy Disturb your drive to become who you're trying to be. But you still got to have enough an anointing and enough power to drive through the enemy's bad intentions. Somebody shout hallelujah. So when you see this Herod, Herod has got this same anointing on him. I don't know. I don't want to even say that. Let me just, come on, but pull that back in. Pull it back in, Joel. Because there's some people, I'm just going to say it anyway. There's some people, there's some people that are assigned by Satan to come after you and everybody in your family. And I'm not going to call the ones names that's come after us. But it seems like every generation got a problem with my people. And I'm trying to figure out why is it that you got a problem problem with us but then one day I woke up they gonna keep having problems no matter what I say to them because they can't control that spirit that's operating in them so it's up to me do I focus on them or do I focus on the intentions that I have to become what I want to be and that is exactly what you've got to do in this house tonight I want you to look at somebody to the left or to the right and tell them I'm gonna be great no matter what I don't care who comes up against me. I don't care who tries to strike me. I don't care who has something to say about me. I don't care what they publish. I don't care what they put on social media. I'm still going to be great. And what I love about it, if they're after you, that is a sign that you're going to be great. If you've got no enemies trying to come after you, I question your greatness because you really haven't done nothing until hell gets mad at you. Somebody shout hallelujah. If somebody in this room know hell's trying to take you out, give God glory in here right now. It's one thing to be known by fans, but it's another thing to be known by Satan and to be known by his enemies because he knows if you ever step into who God called you to be, 
somebody going to pay for it. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. My God, I feel something in here right now. His entire family, the Herodians, they were, they practiced incest. They hated people. They hated each other. And yet they were in a high place. That's why you can't worship the high place. And that's why you can't worship who's in charge. Because you never know what demons came with the seat. Glory to God. I wish I had a witness in here. You trying to stop me. You don't know the person sitting in the seat is trying to stop themselves because they feel the pressure from evil that is about to drive them crazy. They saw what it did to their parents. They saw what it did to their forefathers. And yet they're fighting it, trying to become who they want to become. But evil is always present. It takes an anointing to fight the presence of evil. And I want to know Who's anointed in here tonight? You're not anointed. You can't be anointed. Because if you was anointed, you're sitting in the cut like you're not. Because the anointing costs. It hurts to be anointed. You're a target when you're anointed. Most anointed people don't want to be anointed. And sometimes they stay away from the anointing as much as they can. Because when you're anointed, you're anointed for a task to get the job done. But when you're anointed for a task to get the job done, you're anointed because the forces of hell are trying to stop the job from being done. So when you're anointed, you're telling God, I'll go if I have to go by myself. I'll go if nobody goes with me. I'll go if I'm going broke. I'll go if I'm going crying. I'll go if I'm going sad. I'll go if I'm divorced. I'll go if I'm broken. I'll go if they got the goods on me. I'll still go. I want to know who in this room is anointed. Yeah, see, it's just a few of us that will volunteer for that kind of job. Send me. I'll go. No, the real anointed people didn't want to go. The real anointed people didn't have no choice but to go. Because as many times as we tried to run from the call, the call chased us. The call came from around the corner. The call came from a conversation. You wanted to drink and you heard the call in the can. I wish I had a real witness in here. You wanted to go to the club and they started playing a song that they don't never play in the club. Calling you, telling you, you're too anointed to be here. You're too anointed to be with her. You're too anointed to be with him. The anointing will call you because you were designed to interrupt bad intentions. They were not designed to look cute. I don't know, somebody said, no, that's a lie. Let me tell you something about cute. You don't have to dress cute up. Cute is cute at four o'clock in the morning. Cute is cute with a stocking cap on. I wish I had a witness in here. Cute is cute when your breath is stinking. I wish I had a witness in here. I'm talking about real cute. I ain't talking about made up cute that take you an hour to get cute. I'm talking about waking up cute. I'm talking about going to bed cute. That you do not have to pray for. It came with you. I'm talking all right in here tonight. You ain't got to say nothing to me. But cute can't be your call. 
if all you got is cute, we don't have nothing. I need you to be so anointed that you'll pull them earrings off and your wig and you will get down right there in the floor. It doesn't matter what nobody has to say. I want you to be so anointed that you'll pull your tie off. You'll cut your hair bald. You'll do whatever you got to do to stand up for what's right. That's the kind of anointing that God is looking for. Not you cute people and you sexy people that don't want to do nothing for God unless you're dressed perfect. Got no help in here tonight. Somebody shout hallelujah. All the years that I was preaching this text, looking at this text, this text opens with a blow. The text opens with blood. The text opens with blood. An anointed man dies. We quickly run to Peter and we quickly run to Rhoda. We quickly run to she knowing that Peter was outside of the door knocking and running and telling the rest of the church. But we don't pause and examine the top of the text that says that Herod killed James. He killed him. We don't even pause and funeralize him. We go straight to Peter. And how he was in prison and the angel of the Lord walked him out. We don't talk about James. Which leads me to my first point. Surviving the trauma of triumph. How does it feel to be free? But the one you went in with died. Peter was with James. We don't hear anything about the church praying for James. We're not going to dismantle it. I'm sure they did. But we don't see it. Now what's critical about this is because it is this conundrum that causes people to leave the kingdom of God to this day. Because there were people saying, well, he healed your mother, but he didn't heal mine. My son committed suicide I tried it didn't work and so you've got this dichotomy that you have survivors remorse but yet we're full of the Holy Ghost and that with a mighty burning fire speaking in tongues as the spirit of God gives us utterance but have an inability to explain the mystery of how come I made it and they didn't we don't humanize the gospel enough because we, de- we mystify it so much that when people come in that are not Kojic or that are not Baptist, that are not Catholic or don't have a church background, we cannot teach them that sometimes bad things happen to good people. And I don't know how this is going to work, but one thing I will do is walk with you every step of the way. I will walk you through your trauma. I will walk you through your dark days. You may not get over this tonight. You may not get over this tomorrow. But one thing I can assure you, I will be with you because I am an interrupter of bad intentions. I am here to walk you through your trauma and your circumstances. And we cannot spiritualize that. You cannot speak that in tongues and just walk away. You can speak in tongues, interpret it, and then tell them, I'll be with you. Peter survives the threshing. Now watch what it says. It says that Herod killed him by the sword. That means he decapitated him. He cut his head off. So can you imagine what's going through Peter's mind? Because he's incarcerated with the same plan. And Herod wants to hold Peter because he wants to make a spectacle out of him. 
the Bible opens up clearly and says that he was putting pressure on the believers, persecuting them. And he had already killed James. Now watch what the Bible says. Clearly it says that once Agrippa saw that it pleased the Jews, once it pleased the Jews, then he decided he would hold Peter and then publicly chop his head off. What happens when the church is pleased with you being cut, with you being killed, with you being ridiculed, with you being dogged, with you being crushed, and you might have been guilty, but what happens when the church acts like the world and doesn't want to cover you and be a brother or be a sister, but they're happy that you've been killed. I know y'all don't like this kind of preaching. He survived it. But James didn't. James died. James was a part of the inner circle. If anybody was going to make it seem like James would have made it, Peter, James, John. James is one of the first few brothers that was called. They're the sons of Zebedee. They were partners in fishing. Jesus called them right together. Why wouldn't Jesus save him? But save cussing Peter. But save killing Peter. But save disobedient Peter. Save the one who said, I don't know him, Peter. Isn't it interesting that God saves the ones that you think? I know you don't like that. Let me tell you something. I'm one of the ones. I'm one of the ones that should have been dead. I'm one of the ones that shouldn't have made it. I'm one of the ones that should have been broke down. That should have, but some kind of way, God interrupted the bad intentions. And I'm just looking for somebody in here right now that God saved you. He interrupted the situation and came in on your behalf. You don't deserve it, but he still did it anyway. Somebody shout hallelujah. My God, I want you to go find two or three people and tell them God did it for me. God, 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 God. Hallelujah. If you believe it did it, come on, give him praise in here. Praise him like you love him. The church had been under trauma. They were already being oppressed. But what's interesting here is that James now is the first martyr for believing. Nobody's died yet except for Judas, and we get his deal. But this is one that's in the inner circle whose head is chopped off. This makes a big difference because now the enemy knows if I can crush him and I can crush Peter, this will change the trajectory of Christianity. But what the enemy doesn't know is that the more you persecute God's people since the days of Pharaoh, we multiply. I wish I had a witness. We get stronger and stronger some kind of way. I don't know, but persecution is in our DNA. Persecution makes us rise. So for, for a little while, it seems like we can't take it, but all of a sudden, the spirit of the Lord lifts up a standard, and you start rising through all the trauma and all the trouble and all the trials and some kind of way. I don't know the way, but some kind of way. The more you persecute us, the more we rise. So the persecution was on. They persecuted Stephen in Acts. They watched him, Paul watched him, gave the signal, gave the nod. This is all the trauma that is going through the top of this text. And the text is bleeding. It is bleeding with James's blood. It is bleeding with Peter's thoughts. It is bleeding with prayer from the preachers that are at the house. It is full of blood. It is constantly bleeding. And yet, Peter is in prison, but he's calm. 
Peter's got so much poise that he teaches us how to deal with issues. The Bible says that they put chains on him and they chained him up between quadrants, four men. And with him already knowing that he's not just going to cut his head off, but he saved him after the Passover so that he could cut his head off publicly. He's not going to do it privately. He's going to do it publicly so that he can destroy the mind of the believer. But watch what happens. That while he's doing that, the Bible says that the saints were at the house praying. They were praying. He was locked up. They were praying. He was locked up. They were praying. He was locked up. They were not talking about him while he was locked up. They were not tweeting and texting and Instagram living while he was locked up. They weren't trying to figure out why he was locked up. They just thought that they would call Jesus since they couldn't call nobody else. They called Jesus. Peter was still locked up. And the way the text read it makes you think it just happened right then. He was in there for days and they were praying for days. But what happens is a shift in the text. What happens is that he's chained. And then the text says he stood up. Did y'all see that? He stands up because an angel comes into the jail cell. The angel comes into the jail cell, tells him, stand up. Now, the, the part that gets me here is this. It would seem like you would want the chains to come off first and then tell me to stand up. Taking the chains off makes more sense. Let me tell you why. Chains make noise. And I'm chained to the people that's going to kill me. So why would you want me to stand up and make noise? The people are already chained to me. But he's chained to them. And the angel of the Lord says, stand up. And I said, I don't understand it. Then God said, no, just give them point number two. And those that catch it will catch it. He said, tell them, stand up in their chains. I said, oh my God. You got to stand up in your chains. I don't care what it looks like. Stand up in your chains. You could be chained to your past, chained to your memories, chained to your circumstance, chained to your dilemma, chained to somebody that's trying to kill you. Stand up anyway. You don't have to wait to be cut loose. Stand up and get loose. Wish I had a witness in here. Look at somebody and tell them, stand up in your chains. Ah, you got to have nerve to stand up in your chains. You got to have boldness to stand up in your chains. You got to be anointed to stand up in your chains. I'm just wondering, is there anybody in here tonight that will go find somebody that look like they got a little power and tell them, stand up, girl. Stand up, boy. Stand up, man. Stand up, sister. Stand up. The enemy wants you to stay down, but I want you to stand up. Oh my God, stand up in your chains. Stand up in your circumstance. Stand up in your issues. I know you don't have the money, but stand up. What you want the money first and then stand? Stand while you're broke. Stand while you don't understand. Stand while you're frustrated. Stand while you're trying to get it together. Stand with your mind going crazy. Stand when the doctor said you're not going to make it. Stand in your chains. So I want you to stand up in your chains. Stand up in your chains and he, he stood up in his chains. I, I, I feel a standing anointing in here tonight. Uh, uh, now see the first thing what y'all did and I'm, 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 I'm going to get those of you that were sitting down because there were just a few of us that was up but those of you that were sitting down you watched us stand. Yeah, yeah, you watched us stand because you, you need it to happen before you stand but those of us that stood anyway watch and see what happened. I wish I had a witness here. Watch and see what happened because I don't need to see it to stand. I'm going to stand because I saw it in the spirit. I wish I had a witness in here. Now go find somebody and tell them this is what it looks like to stand in my chains. See the truth of it is we don't want nobody to know that we're in chains. So we dress up like we don't have no chains. You dress up like you're not in bondage, but you got some clinging going on under your wrist. 
There's some stuff you've been dragging around. But I wish I had somebody in here that said, you know what? I'm going to take this thing to the altar. I'm going to take this stuff and get it right. I'm going to stand in my chains. Good God Almighty. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stood up in the chains. Be seated, be seated. Stood up in the chains. Just give me a few more minutes. Stood up in his chains. Y'all all right with teaching? Stood up in them chains. And the chains didn't make a noise. The chains fell off. And when the chains fell off, the angel brought a light in a dark place. And I don't know if you get it, because he could have walked him out like this. But then that wouldn't make sense. Because he who the son sets free is free indeed. So if I'm going to stand up in my chains, God got enough anointing to make me look like what I've never been in. Which is going to change the way I walk. And look at somebody and tell them, walk like a free man. Walk, walk like a free woman. See, some of y'all can't get it because you're chained in here. But you got to walk like a free man. You got to walk like a free woman. A free man and a free woman got their chest stuck out. Got their head lifted high. Stepping high like they just called your name. Like you just graduated all over again. A free man got a different kind of swag. A free man got a different kind of walk. A free woman got a different kind. Stand up! He says, follow me. Follow me. My last point is sinking with your support. The word sink means to get on the same page. We harmonize together. We find each other. And we sink. We may buffer for a little while. But we find it. We stay together long enough to find it. And what I think is interesting in this text is that why are you saying sink? Because I saw two sinks in the text. The first sink is for him to actually catch the revelation that this is not a dream. The Bible says clearly that once he got out, he realized this is not a dream. Now, look at that again. God is cold because if he does it on the inside, then it, will, it could possibly still be a dream. But he walked him out the jail, took him down the street. When he caught the revelation, wait a minute, I'm not in sleep, neither am I in the building that I was sleeping in. Because if it was a dream, he would have still woke up in the same cell. Oh, you catching it? So when he awakens, he's outside of what he's been in. When he comes to himself, he says, this ain't no dream. I know it's supposed to be not, but when you come out of something like that, it's an ain't. This ain't no dream. He synced with the spirit. The spirit is letting him know this is reality. Your reality, God will walk you out of something and pull you out of something so well that he will walk you down the street and then tell you to turn around and look at what he brought you out of. Brought me out of darkness into the marvelous light. Now I understand 
when they sung their song, brought me out of darkness into what? Look where the Lord. That's the first, that's the first, that's the first, that's the first. The second one is when he realized, y'all got to sit down, y'all got to, y'all making me preach right here. <laughs> y'all, 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 sure y'all good with this? The second one is when he realized that he's caught the revelation that this is not a dream. Notice what the text says. Then he goes to the house where they were praying. He would have never gone to the house if he hadn't caught the revelation that this is not a dream. So once he caught the revelation that I have awakened, then he realized somebody been praying for me. Wish I had a witness here. And if you can awaken that this thing that you're going through is real and it's not a dream, God will then take you and draw you near to where the source is. The Bible says that he started seeking up and he went to the house and the prayer was so powerful. They didn't even know it was real. Now, how does he come out of dream world, come into reality, and then knock on the door, and they act like they're now in dream world? Because that's what happens when God does something so powerful, nobody else is going to believe it. And they got to have a second look to see, is this God? I wish I had a witness in here. God's getting ready to do something for you so powerful that everybody around you going to say, I need a witness in here right now. How five somebody tell them, get ready. Get ready. Because God's getting ready to do something powerful. God's getting ready to do something that's going to blow your mind. God's getting ready to snatch you out. God's getting ready to bring you out. God's getting ready to turn this thing around. Pull on somebody and tell them, come on out of here right now. I don't care what you're going through. But if you would just hang on to God. God's getting ready to march you out. But if you don't believe it, get away from that neighbor and stand by yourself. But if you got enough anointing, I want you to lift your hand and tell God, thank you for walking me out the trial, for walking me out the circumstance. I know Herod meant it for my evil, but God meant it for my good. Is there anybody in here that can say God turned it for me, brought me out of darkness into the marvelous light? Turn the organ up for me and turn this mic up for me because I feel a walkout coming. We're about to let hell know we're walking out out of what tried to destroy us. We're walking out out of what tried to deny us. Have I got a witness here? If you put the organ in the house and let me fill it in my soul, I believe we could have a little church for just a few more minutes. Just grab one neighbor that will praise God. Not a statue, not a mummy, but grab a praiser. Somebody that's praising, somebody that came out, somebody that loved God, somebody that knows that if it hadn't been for Jesus who was on my side I I, I don't know where I would be but since God brought me out I might as well give God the glory have I got a witness here give him give God the glory and let hell know you thought you had me but I got away. You thought you were gonna kill me, but I got away. You thought you were gonna drown me, but I got away. You thought you were gonna take me out, but I got away. You thought you were gonna drown me, but I got away. Yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody 
somebody give him glory. Show Peter. He knocked on the door and they couldn't believe it. Rhoda. She went back and told him, I can't believe it, but Peter's out there. They said, ain't no way. She said, what we've been praying about? We've been praying for his release. And then I realized some time ago when they were praying, asking God for the release, he didn't send the release, but he sent the angel. And the angel came in the situation and decided to sit with him. You got to understand when God sends your miracle, you may not come out, but he may get in there with you. You may have somebody that's walking by your side. Have a kind of witness here. You may not come out of your circumstance, but God will come in it with you. Have a kind of witness here. But I, I, I love the Lord because he heard my cry and he pitied my every groan and the angel said put your clothes on we coming out have I got a witness here look at your neighbor tell them put your clothes on you coming out put your earrings on you coming out put your shoes on you coming out you coming out you coming out you coming out snatch that neighbor tell them come out come out come out come out if you're coming out praise him right now so cold about God. If you keep reading that scripture. Herod got upset. Called a meeting. Met with the people. And the people were so enamored with his position and his voice. They said, he sounds like a God. And the angel of the Lord killed him he refused to give glory to the one true living God so not only will God take you out if that enemy keep messing with you I don't think I have to say it he will take out those that are trying to take you out that's why he said vengeance is mine saith the Lord so stop focusing your attention on those who have bad intentions for you because God is going to break that thing and he's going to disrupt those bad intentions and before you know it the only thing you should be shouting about is coming out now I just feel we ought to give him a come out dance I know some of y'all may not like to dance, but if you can't dance, hop. And if you can't hop, jump. And if you can't jump, wave. If you can't do that, step. If you can't do that, walk. But do not sit there if you know God going to snatch you out of something. I want y'all to play some good old coming out music. You got 60 seconds to give him a come out praise. Come on here. That's it. Come on. Come on. Ah, yeah. Come on. Don't watch us. Give him a praise in here. That's it. That's it. 